I was asking Frida earlier when she went to work for the Department of Human Services, is that's when I met her. And she went to work in 1988 there, and I went to work in 1987, so we are both survivors of the Department of Human Services. <laughs> There's a story there. <laughs> several There's stories. There's a book there. Yeah, yeah. Terrible, yeah, several stories. We work for the Division of Children and Family Services. So. Anyway, uh, so I've known Frida for a long time. I'm excited that she's a member of our society, that she's knowledgeable about lots of topics. She spoke last year about Jesse James, and that, that was an interesting presentation. This one tonight is on the Trail of Tears, and judging by the amount of audience we have here, it's a very popular topic. So I'm in charge of programs, so if you all have any program ideas for the future, let me know as well have October open and November. Um, but I am very pleased that Frida came all the way from Stone County up here to speak to us. to see uh, so many people here. Before I start, I would like to thank Gloria Sanders. She's here from the uh, Calico Rock Museum and Foundation. Uh, Robbie Purdom and Mary Tedson from Stone County are here. Uh, and I'm very proud to say that Aubrey Watts is here. He is a direct descendant of Chief John Ross. Wow. Um, and Quaddy Brown. Uh, so, uh, before I get started, too, I'd like to say I have some books that will be available for sale afterwards on Jesse James and some other stuff. I have a uh, muster roll of the bench route, Trail of Tears, everybody that was listed on the muster roll, and those that we have identified. You're welcome to look at them. And then I included some maps and some other stuff. I also have an Arkansas map and, our, and an Arkansas gazetteer. Anytime we can identify through records, oral histories, anything. And I didn't turn this on, Jennifer. There we go. Um, where we, we can identify where they stopped, bought anything, did anything. We I've circled it. And Randolph County has a wonderful... Uh, uh, map where when you pull up anything about their county it's one of the first things that you see is the route through there um, so I'm hoping that uh, we can work with the various other counties and get that um, did you put that microphone I did can you hear me no I'll turn it up a little bit some people back here well, I'm pretty loud <laughs> I've never been accused of being too quiet <laughs> Um, I'd also like to say that Calico Rock on the 7th, 8th, and 9th is having the Mountain Man Rendezvous in Native American Days. That's on a Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. On that Thursday from about noon on, I will be at the Calico Rock Histor uh, Museum and Foundation. We have a little library there, and anybody that wants to come by and visit, work on their genealogy, have questions, I'll be there because uh, there's a lot of people that have uh, interest in that, and I have about 78,000 people in my family tree. It's really a research tree, and eventually the museum's going to take it over so other people can use it. Okay, um, what I'm talking on tonight is why the Trail of Tears came through North Arkansas. The bench route is the only route to come this way. It's very clear why John Ross took the water route, why Herr Conrad went through northern Missouri. There's very, you look at the different routes that the, that the other people took and it's very clear. Well, when you look at the bench route, they kind of do a zigzag, you know, and, and we've been able to, through those interviews and records, show that there's, there, there's these loops. If you, well, actually, I think it's on here. If you look at the handout, in this little map down here, you'll see two, two loops there. Well, they didn't make a loop. What they did is when they, when they got to old Davidsonville, Jackson, they split up. And the reason they split up was to go see family. It was not... Um, I mean, I don't know about most of y'all, but my sister and I can attest to the fact that when we were kids, we didn't stay in hotels. 
We might go to the World's Fair in Texas and you stopped and stayed with people you knew all along the way. Maybe you took some homegrown stuff, maybe you took something, you know, maybe you took them out to dinner, whatever, but you did not stay in a hotel. Well, pretty much that's what they did. From the time they crossed the Mississippi to, into Cape Girardeau, where they went to Apple Creek, Missouri, which is just north of Cape Girardeau. The reason they went there, whoa, I think all of a sudden you hear me. <laughs> the reason they went to Cape Girardeau really sets the history of, of what they, what they, why they went where they did. During the War of 1812, Lewistown, Ohio, can you hear me good? Yes. <laughs> okay. Lewistown, Ohio was destroyed, as well as uh, Terre Haute, in the Indiana, which was the Battle of uh, Tippecanoe. Tecumseh was trying to reunite the Northern Confederacy of, of the Indians at that time, and he had traveled down into Arkansas and Louisiana and all around. During that time, what did we have? What did we have yesterday? An eclipse. So everybody thought he had special powers because he had blacked out the sun. So they started listening to him. Well, then he gets up into Arkansas, and what happens? A new Madrid earthquake. So the Indians are listening, the, you know, and they're like, you know, we need to do this. So the... Cherokee that were in these groups, uh, in these different tribes, had been allied with the British since 1730. If you see also on this right here, this little picture that you see up here, the, you can look up uh, the Trustees of Georgia painting. Uh, there's two or three different paintings that hang in the Royal Museum of London. There was a group of Cherokee from Georgia that went to uh, meet with King George II. And just like you have uh, uh, the lords and ladies of France and Spain and England and all these countries marrying their sons and daughters to each other to ally countries, England did that with the Cherokee. And this that's what they were there for. So. What, what happened after 1730 is you had the John Rosses, who were from Scotland, married into the, to the uh, Native Americans. You had the Bryants, you had the Wards, you had all of these families that were specifically marrying into the Indians to unite them to England. And that pretty much stayed in force until the War of 1812. There were various groups that broke off for various reasons. You had the Chickamauga and, and who were bro broke off from the Cherokee, but pretty much they stayed allied. And in the War of 1812, Great Britain abandoned the Cherokee. They basically had said they would everything west of the Mississippi would belong to the Indians, and, and Great Britain would keep everything on the east side of the Mississippi. Well, when they realized they were losing the battle, Kind of like, okay, bye. <laughs> You're on your own now. So what that did is that created a situation where many of the Indians in those areas had to leave. Wasn't very popular to be British, Scottish, Irish, or Native American. So they moved. And where did they move? They moved to the Ozarks. They moved down through Apple Creek. Chief John Lewis and his wife, Mary Sukuponis of Lewistown, Ohio, brought 4,000 Shawnee to Yaleville. It was called Shawnee Town. You had upper, middle, and lower villages. So all of a sudden, we're in we have this huge influx of Shawnee. Everybody talks about the Cherokee. Well, in 1793, before all of this is happening, but if you realize 
we didn't have our first president until 1790. The, war, the American Revolution wasn't over until 1789. So in 1793, John Watts Bowles, he was actually born John Watts when he was 11 years old. His grandfather, John Knight Bowles, who was a Scotsman, was murdered. So what did this 11-year-old do? He turned around and he murdered all the guys who had murdered his grandfather at 11 years old. And in the tradition of the Indians, he took his grandfather's name. So he became John Knight Bowles. So, or John Watts Bowles. In 1793, he applied for a passport to come to the west side of the Mississippi to the St. Francis Parkin area with 400 Cherokee. We were with France at that time, and he had to apply for a French passport to bring those people here. How many of y'all heard the term off? Oh, you're from off. That comes from the, the passport. If you were traveling a distance greater than 20 miles off from your residence into the, this, to the Louisiana territories, which were actually the Choteau territories of France, you had to have a passport. So the term off meant you had traveled a distance, and that remained in use until about the 1930s, 1940s, when after that, people from the north moving here, it became a way for local people to identify people that had moved from the north here. <laughs> but prior to that, it was actually just a distance. And in a lot of cases, it still is, but you will hear it derog used derogatorily. But it goes all the way back to the French passport and the Louisiana territories. So Chief John uh, Watts Bowles moves here, and um, he has to fight the Osage, who this is their hunting ground. So the word for bowl in Osage is Duwali. So, Chief Duwali is John Watts Bowles. There's a lot of discussion as to whether that's true or not, but how hard is that to figure out? It's pretty simple. So, in 1811, all this is happening with the American Revolution, and you know, or the War of 1812's uh, happening, and all these people that have been allied during the American Revolution. <clears throat> so, they all start descending on the Ozarks. All of these families, uh, 4,000 Shawnee, the 400 Cherokee that had been down on the St. Francis moved up the White River to Norfolk. Uh, the people at Norfolk started writing letters. Uh, there's letters from uh, Michael Wolf, who was Major John Wolf's father, uh, complaining that they were inundated with, that there was 10,000 Indians across the river. And, you know, here's 10,000 Indians in Norfolk Village, which is where the village was at. And here's Liberty over here, which is Norfolk. And they got maybe 100 people. <laughs> so they're a little panicked that there's 10,000 Indians over there. Uh, but pretty much they, they, they weren't upset. The Indians weren't. They, you know, they, they kind of got along. So... During this whole time, there is a negotiation for what became the 1817 to 1828 Indian Reservation that took in a large portion of Baxter County, Izard County, Stone County, Independence, um, went from Point Remove and near Morrillton, up near the border, across down through Batesville and back across. And so that area we have the 1817 Arkansas Cherokee Indian Census, which is made up of Cherokee, Creeks, anybody that was here, Shawnee. All of those people were here in 1817, and when you when we have gone back and looked at those, 80% of those people and their descendants did not leave when the reservation was over in 1828. What they did is they took white names and they kept their land because the whole thing to start with was an issue of land. So, Kun Wasaliska, who you can pull up and you get all kinds of information on, became James Kun Wasaliska Davis. 
James C. Davis held both the French and Spanish land grant of Batesville, Arkansas. He is, and he had 4,000 and something acres. He sold that land to Robert Bean, who is credited as being the first settler of Batesville. He and Ludwig. Well, they bought that land from, from James Davis. So, but you don't hear anything about that. <laughs> all you hear about is the beans and then, you know, the bilers and the, all the other people that, that moved on with that. But because all of these people had the, this incredible association with the uh, British during, prior to the War of 1812, they started, you know, they didn't want people to know who they were. Uh, if you didn't know who somebody's people were, you needed to go on. It was just fine that anybody coming through thought we were barefoot and ignorant because we didn't care. And because if you were not part of this group of people, you needed to go on. It was just that simple. And today, people still have a lot of these attitudes and use a lot of the words. They just don't know why. But it's been bred into us from that heritage. Uh, even Brooks Blevins in one of his books on the history of uh, Arkansas talks about how this area has the greatest concentration of Anglo-Saxon British descendants of anywhere outside of Great Britain. And that's true. It's been recognized over and over and over. When I say this area, it's, Ar it's the Ozarks. Arkansas, Missouri, Kansas, Oklahoma, the Ozark region. And that is because this area looks most like North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia, the area where these Indians were moved from. So during that reservation, those folks moved voluntarily. Today we have a lot of disgruntlement between the Democrats and the Republicans. Everybody can understand that, okay? Back then, we had the Treaty Party and the Nationalist Party. And the people that were here prior to the uh, Trail of Tears were members of the Treaty Party. They were highly, highly mixed blood Indians with the British, Scots, and Irish. They liked the clothes. They liked the kettles. They lived in houses. They did not live in teepees. Um, the people that moved here created a culture of the Ozarks that it's not like the Appalachians, it's not like anywhere else because it is a blending of those cultures, of the Native Americans and the British and Scots and Irish that came here. <laughs> We're just as different as anywhere, you know, other regional pockets of people. So when John Ross, who was also a mixed blood, but he was part of the Nationalist Party when he fought to uh, stop the Cherokee removal. What happened is they decided they would allow the Indians to move themselves. Okay? They got paid $68 and so many cents a person to move those people. When I say those people, it's just that's just a verbiage, it doesn't mean anything. But when they moved the Indians, it was a military movement. This was not a let's round them up and move them out like they had done the Shawnee or the, the Creeks, the Chickasaw, the Seminole. It, that's not what happened with the Cherokee. So when they talk about all the people that died on the Trail of Tears, it's not the Cherokee Trail of Tears. It's the other trails that die. On the Cherokee Trail of Tears, we do not have good records of who died, and here's why. I mean, let's think about it, folks. You're getting paid to move 1,106 people from Fort Payne, Alabama to Mrs. Weber's in Oklahoma. And you only get paid if they show up. You don't get paid if somebody drops off, if somebody dies. You, you know, you get paid 
for how many people left and how many people show up. So we know that the bench route came through here with the sole purpose of ascension and desertion. They left. Aubrey Watts back here, Junior Watts, his family, he's a direct descendant of Chief John Ross. John Ross's daughter, Emily, was married to Jacob Zachariah Ustuli Watts. Their son, James Monroe Watts, was born on January the 5th, 1839 at Iuka, Arkansas. It was very well documented as to the encampment there, how many people were there. They were, you got records that they were camped east of the Wolf House, you know, all these various things that happened. But we also know we have Moccasin Creek. How many people know where Moccasin Creek's at? Think it's named after snakes? It's not. It's named after actual moccasins because we know it was a horrible, horrible winter. They were allotted 80 days to take this route. It took them 106 days. It took them 26 days longer because it, they got to the White River and the current and the 11 point. A lot of them were froze over, so they didn't take the ferry. They went across. And where it wasn't frozen, they went across because they wouldn't pay the 5 cents or the 10 cents per head to go across. So we have all kinds of documents. The Talberts at Cotter, who ran the ferry there, said that uh, Chief uh, Bench would not pay the five cents to cross, therefore 400-something people went across. Okay, 400 and something, right? So where's the other 800 and something? That's where we have these loops. They, different people were going different places to see people. They were getting off the Trail of Tears. Now, we know that Jacob, Zachariah, Ustuli Watts, and Emily Ross could read and write. They could cipher, which is, you know, what we used to call math. But the person that signed in for Jacob Watts when they reached uh, Mrs. Weber's marked with an X. So what do you think the family story that Jacob Watts and Emily got off the Trail of Tears at Wolf House, what do you think of that possibly being true? She's just had a baby, dead a winter, 300 people have died at Iuka, and she get, they get off the Trail of Tears. They've got a household of little babies, and she's just had a baby, and they get off at the Wolf House. Well, now why would they get off at the Wolf House? It's no longer the territorial courthouse. That's in Athens. Jacob Wolf's first cousin, Sally Waters, daughter of his Aunt Lydia, sister of his father Michael, was the eighth wife of Sequoia. Sequoia was an uncle to John Minch. You see this map, see, see the family tree here? Put my glasses off. See John Ruddle Minch, wagon master. You look up, his father and mother were Robert Bench and Nancy Black Fox. Look right across there, you see Robert Bench was also married to Tawny Hawk. Well, you've got Tecumseh there. Tecumseh was also married to Tawny Hawk. So, John Ruddle Bench, his siblings, he had half siblings that were the children of Tecumseh. The, you know, his, mine, ours, and theirs. Doesn't happen today, it just happened today, it happened back then. Well, in 1780, during the American Revolution, Abraham Ruddle, and his brother Stephen, who Abraham was six and I think Stephen was 13, they were captured along with 200 other people at Fort Ruddle, Kentucky. Their father, Isaac um, Ruddle, spent the next 20 years looking for them. And any time there was a gathering of Indians, they would ask, have you seen my sons? Have you seen my sons? 
and eventually they did find them, but the, after they had spent nearly 20 years as living as the adopted brothers of Tecumseh. Well, the family will argue with you that they hated living with the Indians and they were treated terribly. But now with Ancestry.com and international access to records, we know both Stephen and Abraham worked as British spies. British spies during the American Revolution. So, and that would have, that's consistent. Tecumseh was fighting with the British. This was their brother. So it makes sense their allegiance was to them. They had been raised with the Indians. So, you know, it's kind of like DNA now. You can't really argue with some of that stuff. So when, the, when Bench's route entered into Arkansas, they had several opportunities, Davidsonville, Smithville, to stop and have their wagons repaired. The, there were a number of, of great places for them to stop, but they went to Batesville. Why did they go to Batesville? It's where Abraham Ruddle lived. That was a direct connection, somebody they knew who was safe, somebody they needed to see, somebody they were allied with. So they went to Batesville to see Abraham Ruddle. He died in 18... In, 1841, and I, I just kills me that uh, the cemetery has been bulldozed. The only thing still remaining are two above ground carns, one of them which is Abraham Ruggles. Um, but they went there to see him. Then from there, John Bench went to Athens, which was the courthouse and where John Paxton Houston was the clerk. Well, they got there and they found out that John had died in August of 1838. Why did they go see John Paxton Houston? Any thoughts? Ever hear the stories about how Sam Houston, you know, when he was a boy, he was adopted by the Cherokee and he had a name and he ran around with the Indians. Well, that's true, but also his brother John. John and uh, Sam Houston's father died in 1806. They were, I think, 10 and 12 or 12 and 14, something like that. <clears throat> My three times great-grandmother, Margaret Houston, is whose home they were raised in after their father died. They uh, were unruly boys, and uh, her dad was a, their, all of, it's, it's kind of crazy when you look at it, but they didn't have an aunt, or, uh, aunt and uncle to go to, so they went to their father's first cousin, to his home, which was my grandmother's home. Uh, <clears throat> they lived at Pilot Creek, Tennessee which was about 30 miles from Over, Overhills, Tennessee, which is where Chief John Jolly had his village. So Chief John Jolly adopted Sam and John into the Cherokee. Well, you know, John didn't make history books, but Sam did, so we have good records of all that. Well, John, he... Uh, like Sam, abandoned his family more than once. And he um, faked his death in uh, 1818 or 1819, jumped into the river in Memphis, Tennessee. He has a grave in Elwood Cemetery in, in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, they never found a body, but they put up a marker for him. Uh, but then he appeared as a jury, uh, a jurist, which is a lawyer, at the Arkansas, in, in Arkansas. And Jacob Wolf brings him up to the Wolf House 
saying, hey, you can hide out up here. You can have all the women, Indian women you want, all the alcohol you want to drink. They ain't going to never find you up here. Come on. So that's why John Paxton Houston ended up up here. He is hiding out from everybody. So uh, when Sam Houston leaves Tennessee and he, uh, you, they don't find him for a week when he gets to the Arkansas Post, Izzard County has all these wonderful records of John, John and Sam Houston getting into a fight. Sam Houston University and all them people, they don't want to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> don't want to hear it. Well, our great-grandmother, her, she married James Grigsby. They ran the Grigsby Ferry at, between O'Neill and uh, Marcella. Their son's house is the Grigsby House, which sits on Lyon College campus. So all of this stuff is very, you know, it's all intertwined. So they get to Batesville to see Abraham, and Abraham says, well, you know, news is, uh, John, he, did, he may or may not have known, but they had set to rendezvous at Athens. So they, they rendezvoused at Athens, there to see John Paxton Houston. We know that they stayed there a couple of days visiting with people on the, what's now the Stone County side of the river. Now that is family of a different political suasion. These were the families who were part of the treaty party, and they weren't real crazy about being identified as Indians, but yet they wanted to see family, and it was an opportunity for them to do that. So you have Abraham Ruddle, who is the adopted brother of Tecumseh at Batesville. You have John Paxton Houston, who was the clerk of Izzard County and the adopted brother of, uh, or the adopted son of Chief John Jolly. Well, Chief John Jolly, if you look at this, just happens to be the uncle of John Binge. So it would be like John Paxton Houston was his brother. Do you see what I'm saying? I mean, they, they, they didn't just happen to come through here. Now, we know that they went through Wild Cherry. We know they went through Crossroads. We know they went through Stewart, south of Cherokee Village. I've recently went out there, and if you can take an aerial map, which you can't because there's all these trees in the way, even when the <laughs> leaves are gone, but there's these huge boulders in circles. There's just patterns of them on the ground. Well, when I got to researching that with Alan Westerhouse, I think that's his last name, what we found is Stewart is where Jesse Stewart, Jesse Bushyhead Stewart had his first Methodist campground. And that's why it's called Stewart. Jesse Bushyhead Stewart was one of the leaders on the Trail of Tears. He also started the San Diego Tribune. They also started the Phoenix during that time, which was the Cherokee newspaper. But when you, when you stop and think of this, folks, these people were half-breeds. They could walk among the Indians and they could walk among the whites. They were British and Indian. Nobody wanted them. The British didn't want them, or if they did, they would have took them back and they would, wouldn't have been a happy existence. The Indians didn't really want them because they had married into the whites, and so you have the Ozark culture that is fundamentally a blending of all of that, and we said, we're our own people, and if you're not part of us, you need to go home. And that, that remains in our psyche today. Okay, looking at this though, I want you to see how you have James Monroe Watts, who was born on the Trail of Tears, to Emily Ross and Jacob Ustuli Watts. Jacob Watts was the son of John Youngtassel Watts. Now, there's some 
controversy as to whether or not he's actually John's son, that he may be Jacob's son. But Jacob died in 1803, and so if he was Jacob's son, he was raised by his uncle. So either way, it still takes him to the same line of people. Word of Betsy Watts, who is a sister of his father, is an amazing woman. She was married to Nathaniel Gist. That is the father of Sequoia, George Gist. Sequoia invented the alphabet. Nathaniel's father was Christopher Gist. Christopher Gist was the first American surveyor and George Washington apprenticed under him. Oh. You have, she was married to Chief John, uh, to, uh, she's the, yeah, she was married to Robert Jolly Dew. Robert Jolly Dew was a German. So, John Jolly was half German and half Indian. She was married to John Trader Binge, who was a white German. She got Robert Binge. Robert Binge was the most notorious Cherokee of all time. He was, he made, uh, you know, they called Jesse James the first American terrorist. Uh, you know, Robert Binge made him look like nothing. Uh, he slaughtered people in their sleep. He had red hair. He would mingle with the whites, and then at night he'd go in and kill them. Uh, and in 1794, they killed him. Uh, Robert Bench was married to Nancy Black Fox. Her father was Captain Black Fox, who was an Indian, and her mother was Grand Priber daughter of Christian Priber. Christian Priber is the German that came over here to set up a utopia in the Indians. You probably remember just a little bit about that in civics or history, you know. These people were married, when I say these people, these Germans, these whites, and the Indians, these were the lords and the ladies of the, that culture, of the culture that we have here. And so when they came through on this Trail of Tears, all the way from, from Fort Payne, Alabama, they came through Cape Girardeau to see people that had gotten off, the, that had been part of Chief John Lewis's group that had stayed in Cape Girardeau. You can follow John Lewis's route all the way down. You get Rogerstown, uh, Missouri. You get uh, Gainesville, Tecumseh right down into Mountain Home, right on over to Yellville. 4,000 Shawnee. We didn't leave. The people, these Indians did not leave. So when people say to you, you know, what happened to the Indians after the reservation ended, they say, oh, they were all gone by 1830. Yeah, right. No, they were living as white people in cabins and dis not talking to people about their heritage. And so if you couldn't identify yourself as being the son-in-law of so-and-so or the sister or the cousin or the whatever, go on, go on. And we didn't care if you thought we were barefoot and stupid or whatever. If it would just take you on, that's okay. Go away, leave. So even when schoolcraft, uh, Henry Rowe Schoolcraft came through. He stopped at various places and, and met with people. Uh, he recorded, you know, things that made him out to be stupid, illiterate. You know, we didn't trust the government ever. What was he? He was a government surveyor. He was looking for minerals. So, were they going to tell him anything? No. So, you, you know, if you look at things in context, it starts to make sense. So looking at this again, John Ruddle Bench. He is the namesake of Abraham Ruddle. So he, not only was he like his, his uncle to him or his brother, he was actually named for him. So you can see the close relationship 
of just those two people that are extre is extremely well documented. We have that they came down and y'all are welcome to come up and look at this. We have Long's Trail where they entered uh, Randolph County and then they, they hit the um, Sharp County and came into Independence County. Long's Trail was a trace, just like Trammell's Trace. And if you follow that road, it takes you right through Cedar Grove, which is where Mary Arkansas Rogers, who is our four times great-grandmother, wife of George Hicks, who led, they led the Trail of Tears through Fort Smith, is where she's buried in Cedar Grove Cemetery in Sharp County. So they came right through there to more to what is now Moorefield. And from there they went to Ruddle Hill, which is where Abraham Ruddle, his brother George and John, where they had settled. This mill that you see here on this picture, the mill's long gone, but this is on the National Registry of Historic Places. If you were to travel the road going like you're going to Bethesda, it's maybe five or six miles out there, and then you just drop down on the old road and you can still drive across this. It's still there and it's absolutely stunning after a rain. Uh, but this was built by the Ruddles when they first moved there. And that's on the white or what, where, where is? It's on a creek. Creek, okay. It's on a creek. Uh, I don't know the name of the creek, but it's, it's, uh, it's pretty easy to find. It's just a dip. If you're going along the new road and then you see just, you know how you can see the little pockets of the old road, it's just a dip down off the old road and it just comes right back up and it's absolutely stunning. Um, I mean, it, you can get down the river of it and take pictures back of it and the water coming over it. Look at the rock work in it that's still there, the mouth of where the mill set and how it, it's, it's incredible. Um, Anyway, we, uh, we, those two families, it's uh, John Paxton Houston and Abraham Ruddle, it's very well documented. But we also know they came through to see other families. We know that they went to the Wolf House, not just because of the map. I can't remember the gentleman's name from Wolf House. What was his name? Oh, Marlon Bounty. When he spoke, he talked about... <laughs> And Lynn from Cherokee Village, you're going to find this interesting. Lynn gave me this map. It's a huge file on a computer, and I couldn't even get our local printer to get it printed. But this is an old map that's now in the uh, Arkansas History Commission. Lynn had given me this map, and Richard Shedd got a hold, was living down the street from me a couple summers ago, and he said, I need you to help me work on trying to get the Wolf House put on, you know, the Trail of Tears. So I gave him all kinds of stuff, including a copy of this map that Lynn had given me. Well, after I gave it to him, I happened to be down at Lyon College, and they have all the Grigsby papers and different stuff, and, and I was looking through their catalog, and in that, they had a notation that they had given this map to the... Uh, Arkansas History Commission and that it was created by John Paxton Houston, a cousin of the Grigsby's. So you got you start seeing how all of this kind of comes together but this this map which I want to try to get to the Historical Society goes from Old Jackson and Canton and goes right through Cherokee Village to the Wolf House. So we know, even though we haven't gotten but a couple of places documented, this map here, it's Arkansas, but every time we find anybody with a story, with historical records, with genealogy, like the Grimmets outside of Calico Rock, the Grimmets were on the Trail of Tears. They got off. They have owned that land since 1830 or something. Well, you know what? They didn't own it in 1830. They got it when they could first get it, which was about 1840. But when you start looking at that stuff, if they did have it in 1830, then that means that's why they came through Rockwell, was to go see the Grimmins. 
because the Grimmins are on the Trail of Tears. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I'm saying? I mean, and so every time we find anything that supports where people might have lived, where there's genealogy, where there's, uh, uh, we know they bought stuff at seller's store. We know they stopped at uh, just south in Randolph County. There's a place that still has a major spring. Uh, it could feed the whole area, and I can't remember the name of it, but. We know they stopped there and replenished water. We know they stopped at seller's store because uh, the documents of them purchasing items are in the exhibit in Little Rock. So every time you find anything like that, we have docu I've documented it on a map. Well, they were here, they were here. But when you start looking at that, you go, well, they didn't go. You know, 1,100 people did not do this. What they did is they broke into those groups to where they could see people. All right. I don't know. I've turned this off. I've turned this one off. <laughs> what time is it? Seven. Okay. Okay, keep me on target there somebody. Mm -hmm. All right, John, a little bit about John Paxton Houston. He was the first clerk of Izzard County. He died at his desk in 1838. The reason that we know he was alive in 1838 and not 1836, which is what his headstone says, is because we found a land patent that he had purchased land near Helena with another local person. And his son, from the wife he abandoned in Memphis, ended up with it. So we know he was alive in August of 1838, and we know he was not alive when the Indians arrived in January of 1839. So we, we've narrowed it down to that gap. We know he presided over the marriages of Robert Adams, or not Robert Adams, he, Robert Adams' sister, Mary Adams, to Chief Peter Cornstock. Robert Adams and his brother Matthew wanted to be in the reservation when it ended because you could not be on in the Indian reservation unless you were part Indian, married to an Indian, or had established trade with them. So Robert and, Matthew, Robert and Matthew Adams married their younger sister Mary, their parents had just died, that same year, to Chief Peter Cornstalk. She, he was about 30 years older than her. And one son, he was killed in the Civil War. Um, he, that marriage license was signed by John Paxton Houston. We know that John Wolfe Cornstalk married Nancy Avery, and the Averys became the Aveys of Stone County, Marion County, anywhere, any of the Aveys around here go back to that alliance. Well, John Wolfe Cornstalk was the grandson of Chief Hola Casilla. Uh, that's a whole other story. But, the point is, all of these people that ended up here, Sequoia, the, the Cornstalks, the Aveys, those individuals came because of the American Revolution and the subsequent, uh, a lot, their alliance with the British. And by the War of 1812, they were just people. And they could fight, and they could claim land, Abraham Ruddle claimed the land at, uh, that, he, that they settled outside of Batesville in 1814, just at, at the end of the war. Uh, many people claimed land during that time, but a good majority of them that claimed land had already been living on it. That's what people don't realize. And we've looked at that, and we've found 
enough documentation and trade records and other things to say yes they did. Uh, John Paxton Houston was also signed and this is in Sequoia's cabin in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. John Paxton Houston signed the marriage license to Sally Waters. Sally Waters was born in 1790. She was the same age as Lydia Dark Star, daughter of Tecumseh. They were raised as, their mothers were raised as friends. Lydia Wolf and Tawny Hop were friends. Tawny Hop named her daughter Lydia Dark Star, Tecumseh's daughter, after Lydia Wolf. When you go back to where they lived prior to coming to Norfolk, you find they lived less than 20 miles from each other. So how common was the name of Lydia in the Indian group? You don't find Lydia's. So that, that we, we can assume that relationship there. Um, Went through to see what else I've got written down here. The conductors. We talked about a minute ago that the people that led this were mixed breeds. Well, not only were they mixed breeds, they were all related to each other. The assistant conductor to John Ruddle Binge was George Lowry. George Lowry was a first cousin to Jacob Watts. Jacob Watts was and uh, and he was married to the aunt of John Bench. He was the son of John uh, John George Lowry and Nancy and Lusta Watts, which was uh, made them cousins. Uh, his sister Nancy was married to Dewali, young the chief of Arkansas. Lucy Bench, daughter of Warda and John Bench, was an aunt to John Bench. She was a sister to John Jolly, the bench in Sequoia. Robert Bench was a wagon master. He was the son of the bench and Tawny Dark, Dark Star. So he was the son of Tecumseh. I mean, the wife of Tecumseh. So his sibling, Tecumseh's siblings were his half siblings, or Tecumseh's children were his half siblings. John Young and Richard Gist were assistant wagon masters. John Young was the son of G Chief John Totola Young, and Richard Gist was the son of Sequoia and Sally Waters. Makes more sense that they would go to the Wolf House if you've got uh, a child on that that is <coughs> a relative of the people at the Wolf House. So you start looking at those relationships, you can't really refute that they went there. But because there's no real documents that they were there on the Trail of Tears, that's why that map that Lynn Maxidon gave us that the, became so important. John Rogers, uh, he was the son of John Hedman Rogers. Uh, he was a brother to Tiana Rogers, wife of Sam Houston. He was a commissary. George Watts Lovett, y'all ever heard of Lyle Lovett? This is his family. Uh, he was married to Jenny Lowry, who was a sister to, the, to George Lowry, who was the assistant conductor. And Anderson Pierre Lowry, their son, was the interpreter. So, all of these people that got paid to be in these positions were family members. And only if 1,106 people showed up did they get paid for 1,106 people. Was that a prestigious job or was that a, did, were they liked, loved, were they hated, were they, what were the... Considering they didn't really get along with John Ross, it was a political deal. John Ross couldn't easily move all these people from those areas west when they hadn't been there. So who was there? 
to do it? All the people from the treaty party that had already moved. So they sent people back to Georgia and Alabama to move the people because they knew the routes. John Bench knew where all these people lived and so they made their route with the sole purpose that people on that could get off. They could, they could get off at Wild Cherry, Arkansas. They could, you know, you hear these stories about, well, you know, their, their parents died on the Trail of Tears and they took in this child. That's true, it's true. But think about it. Our great-grandmother had four wagons and something like 11 slaves. That's what people don't realize. When you look at this right here, it will tell you males under the ages, Negroes under 10, Negroes over 10. Those were not free people. Those were slaves. So <coughs> we're talking about slave-holding people that left houses and farms that could afford a wagon that cost the equivalent cost $5,000 in that money, which is the equivalent of those $100,000 Airstreams today. So you're talking about people with money that were on the Trail of Tears. But what the whites and the Indians don't tell you is about all the people that walked behind them, the people that didn't have any money, the people that were not half-breeds, the people that were not politically connected, and those are the people that died. And they're not accounted for. It's that simple. Now, we know Jacob Watts made it to Mrs. Weber's with an X. <coughs> but it's inconsistent that Jacob Watts would sign with an X when he could read, write, and cipher. And so could his wife. He was the nephew of Chief Duwali, Chief of the Arkansas Cherokee, and his wife was the daughter of Chief John Watts. So what do you, th or Chief John Ross. So why would he sign with the next? It wasn't him, folks. He got off the Trail of Tears at the Wolf House. Then they settled in near Fayetteville is where they ended up living most of their life and their kids came back into this area because other family members got off here too. Uh, I have a picture here of two, two people that are really important. These two people here. This is a, a drawing of Chief John Watts Bowles. This person here, which Jim gets irritated at me that I do this, but this is Jim Hinkle. Jim Hinkle it would be this person's like fifth or sixth great grand nephew. But I want, I'll pass this around. You can look at the family resemblance. It's there. This man is Elijah Chapel. He is, Elijah Chapel was the son of Mary Rebecca Bench and John William Chapel, grandson of Robert Bench and Nancy Black Fox. He named Mountain View. They had they put the names in a hat, and Elijah drew it out. Or his his recommendation for Mountain View was drawn out. You can look at him, and you can see the family resemblance. I mean, that's not his hair; that's a hat. But I'll let y'all pass that around. But we've been doing the DNA and the family trees and the genealogy on people and what we're finding is just incredible. And then we go back to the land patents and what people had. And so I really encourage anybody that's here that if you believe you've got Native American ancestry in you, uh, sit down and visit with me because we can go back. Don't rely on Ancestry.com's DNA test. When it came back, it said that I had no Native American. Another girl in our town, Martha Roper, Martha Blackwell, said she had none. He said Aubrey Watts had none. So we ran them through, we called Ancestry.com, and 
believe it or not, this was their exact word. What do you expect for $99? <laughs> 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 oh. They go back five generations, and within that five generations, they look at what is your primary makeup of people. They're not going back all those generations that we need. Five generations is your two times great grandparents. So when we ran Aubrey's through another program, his came back at 24.6 or 24.9. Yeah, it was right at 25%, which is what we had, a, had just figured, it, you know, just calculating what we knew that it should be. It came back. What was the cost increase on that second search? Well, we <laughs> argued with Ancestry enough that they gave us, they gave a few of us an opportunity to run it through, but I think it's about $400. We ran mine through, mine came back at 14.9%. We ran Martha Blackwell's through, hers came back at like 15.6%. Uh, because they're not looking beyond five generations. They're looking back to your great-grandparents, basically. And if your great-grandparents didn't really have, you know, like John Ross had, was one-eighth Indian. But Jacob Usuli Watts was half Indian. So Emily Ross was only one-sixteenth. Do you see what I'm saying? So then you figure those amounts and you start figuring who they married and you have to look at the other people and start figuring in those amounts, and by the time we got down to where Aubrey was at, we figured, well, it could be as, as little as, you know, 1-100. But when we, we knew different people, and we said, you know, his is going to be really high, and it come back nothing. So we were like, whoa, wait a minute. So when you start looking at it, it's really important who you get it done. But the reason Ancestry.com is very good is because it will, if Lynn Maxinon and I, or Jennifer and I, have any common relatives in that five generations, it will tell us. And that is really cool because sometimes you have relatives you didn't think you had. Uh, and we didn't know, like we didn't know the uh, maiden name of our two times great grandmother, uh, Frances who was married to a Burns, well, we started showing up DNA matches to the Romines, and we had heard that was a possible last name for her. Well, it was. It had to be, because we couldn't have been related to those people if it wasn't. So we were able to find stuff. But you need to keep in mind, if you do want to do your DNA, what are you looking for? Our documentation of who's who in uh, that I have an ancestry and anybody's welcome to use it. We're eventually going to turn it over to the Calico Rock Museum and Foundation because it is a research family tree is what it is. And I have 78,000 people in it, but I have it documented all the way back to Jamestown. People don't realize Enzanor Powhatan had like 30 children. You wouldn't believe how he was, um, because he was associated with the, saving all the white people that were at Jamestown. Well, you know, how did they save them, y'all? They married them. You know, those white men <laughs> married the women. So they had all these children, and you start seeing all of that when you start looking at, at it. But when you realize the relationships between people at that time and where people lived, and how they traveled and what they did, you start making all the sense in the world of how John Bench's route came through here. So if you have a family story that uh, the Trail of Tears came through near your fam grandpa's house, that, that, that your grandma witnessed them and that what, their farm was at the intersection of Sage and Wild Cherry or Rockwell or Crossroads, we need to know that. Because those, that's how we are documenting things to determine where these different groups went. And then it's just like uh, the Grimmets. We were able to trace them all the way back. And it does say, I think it's 1824, when it says they got their land patent. 
Well, if they did, then that means they were part of the 1817 to 1828 group that was here, but denied it even then. But does that make sense? But why would have the Grimmins who are on this come through Brockwell if it wasn't to see the other Grimmins? So when you start looking at that, that's how we're determining how, what, how the group went. So instead of me keeping talking, if there's anybody who has any questions. Is it still considered that the Tahlequah is the end of the tractors? Or is that there's an Tahlequah is considered the end of the Trail of Tears, but I'll tell you it was not called the Trail of Tears. Uh, that is a term that actually didn't even happen until about 1910, uh, nearly a hundred years after it. Uh, they did say the Indians called it the trail where they cried, but it was a white person writing a poem about it that gave it that name. And there's actually several places around Tahlequah that they went to. Weber's Falls, Oklahoma. Um, there's several places there, but Tahlequah is the headquarters. And primarily it was because Sequoia set up there. Because it's pretty much controlled by the Indian population. Yes, and somebody asked me earlier, how could they become a member if their ancestor was Native American? <laughs> Forget it. Uh, if you have an ancestor who lived on the reservation between 1890 and 1905 and they were on the Dawes Roll, which is the last roll that was taken, and you can prove that this was your ancestor, you have the death certificate, you have the marriage certificate, you have census, then you can probably get a card. But as I told somebody else, why? Because we are our own people, first of all. Second, who wants to go to an Indian school? I mean, you can't just go to any college you want to. And why would you go to the reservation for health care? Those are the two reasons to get the card other than just basically trying to prove that you're an Indian, you're a card-carrying Indian. Well, you know. The treaty party, which was us, basically looked down on all of the people that were of the um, nationalist party because they were willing to take government handouts. And we were not. We were self-sufficient and we were going to prove it and we were not taking anything from anybody and we were going to do whatever it took to hold on to our land. It still exists today. You, even even uh, Stan Wadi burned John Ross's house during the Civil War. <laughs> um, I had had something that you would love to have, and I've lost it on my computer that went down. But it came from Ray Watts, and it was a... That's Junior's grandpa? Uh, uh, uncle. It was like... Almost step by step. I have that. Have I have that. Oh, and that, the, what she's talking about is Ray Watts wrote about the Cherokee coming through so and so's farm and camping at such and such place. Part of that is, part of his documentation is why we know that 300 people died at Iuka. And it was a horrible, horrible winter. It, they, it took them 26 days longer to, to travel than they had anticipated. Those people died. They had to just leave them covered there with whatever they could cover them. And in the spring, when the snows melted and the rains came, the moccasins washed down the creek. And that's why it's called Moccasin Creek. I have a map up here that will show you right where it's at and it's in direct line with the Wolf House. And it, they called it the place between two springs. That's North and South Moccasin Creek. Somebody else had a question? Yes, yeah, I'm particularly interested in this little yellow map. And right beside Dadesville, 
there's the town called Salt Rock. Yes. I, I know families have been there forever and ever. Is there perchance a possibility that there are some tie in with these settlers? Very they possible. Go back and research? Very possibly. Anybody that knows that they have family here prior to 1850 needs to look at why. Why were they here prior to 1850? Uh, we have family that were here in 1817, left, went back to the east, and then came back again. Uh, but we have family that, that arrived that were here by 1850. And when you start looking at why they came here, some of it's disease, some of it, you know, I mean, the Civil War was coming and a whole bunch of people from Wayne County, Tennessee said, uh-uh, we ain't going to be here, and they moved here. So Sulphur Spring, Sulphur Rock could be mostly Cherokee. It could be. We'd have to go back and look. There's all, any time you have a river, you're going to have settlement areas along it. So it's worth looking at. It's worth looking at, yeah. And you can find a lot of the land records on the Bureau of Land Management website. Somebody over here had a question? I would really like to know how they kept people from saying going to visit their relative and then saying, I want to stay. Did they have to go out with posses to bring them back so they'd get their money when they got to Oh, no, 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 no. What happened is, you had 1,106 white people, 140-something slaves on the Trail of Tears. Walking behind the Trail of Tears was another probably five, 600 people. And I figured they're the ones that took the shortest route from Davidsonville to Norfolk that went straight through, through Cherokee Village and you know, they took the shortest route as the crow flies. So, Emily Ross and John Watts, Jacob Watts, want to get off the Trail of Tears. So, you go over here and you say, hey, Joe, you've been walking this whole way, and, uh, you know, we're going to give you a horse to go the rest of the way from here. Just when you get there, you're not Joe Chickenfoot. You're, you know, because Joe Chickenfoot's name is not on this roster. You're Jacob Watts. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so every time somebody in that 1,100 people wanted to get off the Trail of Tears, somebody that was walking took their place. And those people that were walking, many of them got off. And many of them died. Those are the people we don't have records for. We don't know who they are. We don't know what happened to them. You know, we don't know who took John Jacob Watts's place. We just know somebody did. Because he didn't end up there. It's real simple. He did not end up there. You do not ever find Jacob Watts and Emily <coughs> Ross on the Indian Census of Oklahoma. And they should have been on the 1840 census. They weren't there. He's listed in Washington County, what's now Washington County, Arkansas. Any other questions? Could you describe the type of policing that went along with this movement? I, I, there wasn't I, no police. So, I, I mean, in the sense of... Trail of Tears was initiated by the government to move the Okay, Indians. you're talking about the removal of the Seminole, the Creek, the Chickasaw, and Choctaw. Those people were moved by military force, by white military wow. government force. They were whipped, they were chained, they were, uh, some of them drowned on boats. We know that People were treated so, so badly that on one of the movements of the creek, there was like 10 women that just voluntarily went, jumped overboard and died to drown themselves because they couldn't take it anymore. When you're moved by force, I mean true force, it's a different, it was a different ball game. 
people did die. You know, they infested the blankets. We know from George Hicks's records that when they got to Dwight Mission in uh, what's now Fort Smith, uh, that they were given new blankets and that two weeks later, half of the people that had been on that died of smallpox. Mm. Mm. We know from the Arkansas Dem Dem the Gazette, the paper, different things that happened. Um, but the Cherokee was a different story because John Ross filed a lawsuit and won, saying that they did not have to leave. Andrew Jackson said, great, let me see you enforce it. So, it's fine you stay in your home, but how are you going to do it? When them white guys are coming down there and they're taking your stuff and there's nobody to protect you. And if you kill that white man, we're going to kill you. So they had, no, they had no choice. So what Ross did is he negotiated for them then to be able to bring their own people. That, and then not having people that knew the way west, they brought those people from the west back across the Mississippi to lead them back. So here's uh, Chief John Jolly saying, hey, John, you want to go over? Or, you know, we'll, you'll get, we'll get $68.05 a person for you to bring this contingency west. And you hire whoever you want to. Oh, well, so John walks out and he says, oh, yeah, you know, well, let's get Uncle George and let's get, uh, he, he, well, oh, yeah, Andrew, he can speak uh, English and uh, Cherokee, so let's get him. And, you know, that's exactly how it happened, folks. So there's probably a lot of deception in that recruiting. Of course there was. Come out, right? Of course there was. Nepotism? It didn't start with white folks. Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, so they got all these people to, when you look, and it's true, you look at um, this, this one here. I've listed who the people are in the other routes. These are the Cherokee detachments. Herr Conrad. Herr Conrad was, uh, John Ruddle Benj was married to his sister. He led the route. Uh, one of the routes that left on uh, August 23rd, 1838, arrived January the 17th, 19, 1839. Elijah Hicks uh, was the son of Charles Hicks and Nancy Broom. Jesse Stewart Bushyhead, he was Izzard County's first preacher. Chief George Hicks, that's my ancestor. Uh, James Brown, son of Hunalusta Brown and Lucy Bingy, Binge. Oldfield, John, Chief John Binge. Mo, Henry Moses Daniels. Henry Moses Daniels is buried at the Buckhorn in, at St. James, Arkansas. Richard Taylor, son of Thomas Fox Taylor and Jenny Walker. Peter Hildebrand, ever heard of Sam Hildebrand up in, during the Civil War? He's a big... A uh, gorilla led a whole group of people over in uh, just north of us, up around below Cape Girardeau. That's his family. So the Hildebrands got off. Uh, John Drew. You take all of these and you start looking who, because I wrote down who they are, son of, sister of, you know. All, all of them, every group was interrelated to the other groups. So even though John Ross was the chief of the Cherokee, he was chief of the Cherokee East. John Jolly was chief of the Cherokee West, which, and Duwali was the chief of the Arkansas Cherokee. Because most people don't realize uh, the, the way that the Cherokee government is set up is just exactly like a president, vice president, the cabinet, the American government system is based on the Native American system, which is based on the English, English system. Because we went to England in 1730 and we set up this new hierarchy. So, when you look at it that way, you've got your chief and all of your compadres over here on the east and on the west. One's Republican, one's Democrat. But 
but the Republicans had to have us to come across to lead them back, or vice versa, you know, nationalist and treaty party. So when you look at who all those people are, I'm sure you know Fields, Walkers, Smiths, uh, Drews, Cody's, uh, Aves. I mean, I can just go down a list of last names of people that we can take you back to the Trail of Tears. Hicks. Okay. Thank you very much.